I guarantee you this is going to be one of the strangest texts you'll ever hear preached from. Is that fair enough? Um, let's read together from Genesis 31 verses 10 through 13. It says, in breeding season, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw that the male goats mating with the flock were streaked, speckled, or spotted. The angel of the Lord said to me in the dream, Jacob, I answered, here I am. And he said, look up and see that all the male goats mating with the flock are streaked, speckled, or spotted. For I have seen all that Laban has been doing to you. I am the God of Bethel where you anointed a pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now leave this land at once and go back to your native land. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we recognize that there are some, some rich things here. And Lord, we just pray that you would help us today to stay focused, that you would help us to stay awake and alert. And Lord, that you would bring our hearts in line with your word, that we would put our faith and trust in a God who is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. All God's people said, amen. amen. So we're going to talk this morning, go on to that uh, right here, perspective, focus, and animal husbandry. No, really. You didn't know you signed up for an animal husbandry class, but here you are. This started off with a different title, Focus, Perspective, and Quantum Physics. But uh, that would take a little longer. So we want to keep it short and concise and be able to get to the point as quickly as possible. But I really do want to talk to you this morning about perspective. Let's look at that next slide. Perspective is the thing that gives us the ability to see more than just one-dimensional. It is vital that we recognize that there's a big, broad picture going on, that we are not just the center of our story, but actually God is the center of all things. And he uses us to bring into perspective. I want to just give you a, a, a help to see this. Think of a, a guy who is a seasoned sailor, and he, he's equipped, he's very capable of handling himself, and yet he finds himself shipwrecked, and he's got this little dinghy he's clinging to, this little lifeboat, and he is getting more and more distressed as each day goes by. There's more and more concern because all he sees is diminishing resources. The water that he brought is being drunk up. His food is long gone, and each day the sun beats down on him hotter and hotter and hotter. And he is stuck in this situation and he is without hope. And he cries out to God and says, God, you've forgotten me. Why have you completely left me in this place? And his perspective is focused only on what he is experiencing. The pain, the suffering. And yet God, who is not limited to this earthbound perspective sees what is actually transpiring. What God has actually put in place is for a huge cruise ship to come along and to pluck this poor guy out of the water and the music and the, the dancing and the joy and the food and the buffet. You ever been on a cruise ship? Uh, yeah. It's, uh, I, we were once kings, I think. Once queens and lived on a cruise ship. And God sees this coming and God's perspective is so different because he sees what's about to happen. I want to share with you that that is the challenge of our human mind is to recognize our limited perspective. But even more important than that is to recognize God's limitless perspective. He has no limit. He never lacks perspective because he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. He is not only seeing the man drifting along in despair, but he also sees what is about to transpire. He knows this man's despair will soon turn into joy and hope and, and just exuberance as he is plucked from this ocean. Suddenly, a point of view, the ship will appear on the horizon and a sense of proportion, a rescue, will give this man the perspective that he once lacked. Here's where I'm going with all this this morning. Until we gain the perspective of God's sovereign rule in the affairs of nations, despite how hopeless it might seem, we will live as a people without perspective. We'll go drifting out through life. 
Anyone struggling with the results of the 2020 election? Maybe we only have a limited perspective. Or how about the circumstance that we face? Anyone have any frustrations with COVID restrictions, mask mandates, economic shutdowns? These things can all rob us of our joy and bring us into a place of frustration if our perspective is limited, if we only see what stands before us. Up to now, we've taken steps to do our part to determine the outcome of the election. We prayed. How many prayed for the election? I know most of you in this room. Some of you fasted. We did a month, uh, a month of, uh, uh, of Monday fasting and prayer. So I know that many of us did real work. We interceded. And we also intervened in this situation by casting our vote, right? We trusted, we hope, that our vote counted, right? And it wasn't neglected someplace in some back alley somewhere. We did our best. And I want you to know that God is more than capable of taking care of the rest. We do our best. God has to take care of the rest. He's the sovereign one. He's the one who, who, who sees the big picture, who sees where we are in this process. God has a perspective from his eternal vantage point. Let's go to that next slide. God is a sovereign universe, ruler over all the universe. It says in Daniel 4, verse 25, The Most High is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and gives them to anyone he wishes. God is sovereign. He has authority that is unrestricted, for there is no authority higher that can oppose it. He is the creator of the universe and everything in it. He possesses every ability to be in absolute control over everything. He is all-powerful, so no one can interfere or deter him from his plan and his purpose. No one. No power of hell, no plan hatched in the back alley, no idea that seemed good to man at one time can prosper in the face of Almighty God. He is all-knowing so that his judgments, they lack no degree of information or wisdom to rule justly in all matters concerning his creation. He's free of any restraint whatsoever in his creation. He can do precisely as he wills, whenever he wills, to carry out every detail of his, of his eternal purposes. He is sovereign on heaven, and on earth, there's nothing that escapes his gaze. There is no unrighteousness that can be left behind. And yet, and yet, he chooses to partner with us to bring about his purposes. He wants to work with us to see these eternal purposes fulfilled. You remember in Jesus in real life, the roof? What does the roof signify? You remember, it's pop quiz time. Put you on the spot here. What's the roof? What's the top of the roof? The apex of the roof? God. So a father with children, right? Our God loves us like his kids. What else we got there? What's over here? You can flip the next page. I can see they're struggling this morning. We got Jesus, the servant king. And in him, we identify as servants, right? Right? And then we have, I heard over here, Rob, thank you, the Holy Spirit, the ambassador, who gives us the ability to cry out and say, come, be friends with God. What a great opportunity to partner with him. He is the literal master of the universe, and he partners with us through prayer to bring us about his purposes on earth through intercession and intervention. I want you to know and understand that it's not good enough just to pray about stuff. Okay? We want you to pray. Don't get me wrong. Jesus said, listen, this is how you should pray. But there are so many people that think that all they have to do is just pray about something. I got to tell you the truth. It's a good thing to pray. It's valuable. In fact, it's the most powerful currency that we possess. But if you think you're going to pray yourself through the changes that you need to make in your life whether they be at the macro level, the nations, what God is wanting to do in this nation, what God is wanting to do in that nation. If, all you think that, if you think that all you need to do is pray, you're kind of missing the point. 
Jesus has given us autonomy. He's given us free will. He's given us authority. He's put the earth into our hands as a place of dominion. He has said you wa he wants us to be fruitful and multiply. He wants us to, to, to expand his kingdom. So we have to do both. We can't just pray. We also have to act. In God's sovereignty, he controls the seasons. He has dominion over the affairs of nations. He is all-powerful. The course of world events is determined by him. He removes world leaders and he lifts world leaders up. That's his job. He raises up a nation and he brings another down. He, conf he commands the forces of nature. He regulates the laws of the universe. Why? Because he created them. He is sovereign. He is God. He knows that we lack the ability to know. He knows that we lack the ability to know. We don't know what we don't know, Donald Rumsfeld said famously. We don't know what we don't know. And that's profound. Because most of us go through our life acting like we know it all. But we don't even know what we don't know. I don't know what I don't know. I think I know a lot of stuff. But then something happens and I realize, no, I, I didn't know that. God is sovereign. We are not. God knows. We don't. God, though, awesomely, incredibly, in the most powerful sense of that world, world, word, God partners with us to see his will done. That, that's crazy. That's incredible to think that the sovereign God chooses to slow himself down, hold himself back just a little bit, and hold us by the hand like a father with a child. Our Father, which is heavenly, our Heavenly Father, our perfect example of fatherhood, chooses to pace himself to our pace. He chooses to align himself and, and allow himself to be slowed down so that we can come alongside of him. I, I have a testimony of, of being very interested in politics. I have a, an, an, an unhealthy interest in politics. And I have since I was a kid. My, my mom and dad told me, you know, that when I was a little, little boy, I wanted to watch the political debates. And I've been fascinated by politics all my life. And I remember back in, in I, was, I was deeply affected, like many of you probably, by the Watergate fiasco and what happened. And for many of us, it was the first time in our lives that we recognized that sometimes powerful people do really bad things. And they do things that really are corrupt. And it was really hard for us as Americans to get our head around. And, and I was only about 12 at the time when this happened. And I'm like, how could, how could our president, whom I loved and admired, how could he do this? And I, I didn't recognize all the stuff that was going on there. But I realized that bad stuff had happened in Watergate. And so when Jimmy Carter ran in 76, I was excited about a Christian president. And so I encouraged my, my parents, who were not very political, that they should vote for Jimmy Carter because he is a Christian. And I think he probably was, is, he's a pretty bad leader, but a great person, right? We recognize the fruit of his life has been really awesome. Not maybe the best president. So in 1980, I was really excited because Ronald Reagan came on board. And I, yeah, I can see your response too. You feel the same way about him that I do. What a leader. And I thought, wow, this guy's the real Christian. He's the real deal. And I was still too young to vote for him, but I encouraged my parents to get out the vote. And they were excited to be able to, to vote for Ronald Reagan. In college, I was introduced to extreme conservative politics. The John Birch Society, I don't know if you've ever heard of them. Not exactly mainstream. But I was enamored by their anti-communist views and I loved the idea of their call to get out, get the US out of the UN. I thought it was a great idea at the time. Still not sure it's a bad idea. 
1984 comes along and I'm finally old enough to vote in a presidential election. I took great pride in voting for Ronald Reagan. And see the opportunity to see the country change, to see values come in and, and to believe that some things could change for the better. And I recognize that as I look back through life, I find myself less and less enamored with the people and more and more confident that God is in control. And so whatever way you voted, I, I trust most everyone in here voted and I suspect that we all voted a particular way. Whether you did that way or didn't do that way, whatever that way might mean to you, I can tell you this, God is in control, right? It isn't over even yet. It isn't over. And we continue to believe that God is going to do what God is going to do. He's going to raise up men and women. He's going to bring down men and women. I do know one thing. He's not at all impressed with corruption. He's not at all impressed with perversion and such things. He's not all at all impressed with any of that stuff. So as we pray and as we continue to partner with him, we can see his purposes unfold. But it's not going to be a political solution. It's going to be a Moses solution. Arms upheld, crying out to God, saying, God, change, change this nation, change me, change my heart. May I love like you love. May I be filled with your Holy Spirit's anointing because I want to do what's right. I know what I want to see happen. I suspect you want to see the same thing. I will continue to pray for that outcome. But if it doesn't happen, I refuse to drift in the sea of despair. I was rescued from my raft, raft of limited perspectives on the day that Jesus set me free. And so were you. We were set free from a limited perspective back in the raft, back in the old days. Jesus set us free and he gives us an eternal perspective. So let's recap, okay? God is all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He can be everywhere at once. His eternal perspective and sense of proportion is what keeps this entire universe in order. And although he is more than capable of running this entire universe like clockwork entirely on his own, he chooses to partner with us. Through intercession, that's praying, and through intervention, that's doing what you got to do, whether it's vote or go to work or whatever it is, whatever intervention is going on, you've got to do that. He relies upon you to do what we are called to do, to make things happen. God partners with us. He chooses to. Things usually happen in a normal and natural way, seed time and harvest, sun, excuse me, sunrise and sunset. Um, all these natural things happen normally. But occasionally, partnering with him also involves the supernatural. Like Randy was sharing last week, sometimes axe heads float. Just ask Elisha, right? Sometimes axe heads come right to the surface of the water. Sometimes the sun moves backwards. Just ask King Hezekiah. Sometimes God's armies only prevail when Joshua and Hur hold up your arms. Just ask Moses. Sometimes food, quail, and manna. I mean, quail's good stuff. I don't know what manna tasted like, but quail eggs, come on. That's something to be excited about. God gave us quail and manna. It just falls from the sky sometimes. Just ask the children of Israel. Rocks provide water sometimes. Sometimes a baby is born to a virgin. Just ask Mary and Joseph. In each of these examples, we see God doing the miraculous in partnership with a person willing to engage in supernatural living through partnership. He is waiting on us. The God of the universe is waiting on us. Let's look at that next, next slide because this is where I was going to get all excited and all the science nerds in the room would have been thrilled because we were talking about science and all the sci-fi nerds would have been thrilled because it would have backed up their strange notion of what's entertainment. 
I'm preaching to my wife there, the biggest sci-fi nerd that I know. This woman can plow through an entire knit sweater in an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. It's amazing. <laughs> the ability to multitask amazes me. And she can still kind of have a conversation with me while that's going on. It's amazing. I'd love to take the next half hour expounding on what limited knowledge I have through reading a singular book and several articles on quantum physics. It would blow your mind. I won't do that this morning. It'd take at least a half an hour and uh, that would be unkind to you. And my wife read it. She's got a master's in education. She said, no, nah, you can't do that. That's way too much. So to save us a lot of time, I'm just going to give you the book recommendation for now. Perhaps we'll dig into it next time. It's a Christian view on quantum physics. It's called Upper Dogs. The subtitle is Christians Have the Advantage. It's time to take it. That's impressive. I like that. I listened to that. I read that. And it's like, wow. It'll free you up in your mind to recognize how this works together. God's sovereignty and how he uses physical laws and how he suspends them and how he transcends them. It's an amazing book. I highly recommend you get it. If you're looking for gift ideas, there you go. I don't have a financial stake in it, but I highly recommend it. Let's go on to the next slide. That's all we're going to talk about with quantum physics this time. We're going to talk about the power focus. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. <clears throat> See, I'm trying to be focused here. <clears throat> I couldn't not talk about quantum physics a little bit because Pastor Randy was really excited. Yeah, I know you'd be excited about it, Dan. You could probably teach the class, but let's focus, focus on the power of focus, folks. Paul says in Philippians, do not be anxious about anything except the 2020 election. <laughs> Do not be anxious about anything except Governor Newsom and his tyranny in California. Do not be anxious about anything except someone asking you to wear a mask. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by seeing... That's prayer. And petition, that's verbalizing them. Verbalizing them through petition with thanksgiving. Present your requests in partnership to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This partnership is amazing. He works, God works outside of our time and space continuum, is therefore limitless in his ability to intervene. He can't be held back. He can intercept at any time into our timeline. He's not held back by our linear timeline, which only goes forward, never goes back, never goes sideways. God says, well, I can go anywhere you want. He's like the queen in chess. He can go anywhere. He chooses to partner with us to bring about his purposes. We partner with him through intercession and intervention. That's the acting and the praying. When we are focusing intently on a problem or issue, we are partnering with God to make possible what seems impossible. And our prayers and focus have real measurable weight. I'd love to get into that with you, but I won't because I need to focus. We can then enjoy the peace of God which transcends our understanding as we keep our hearts and minds on Christ Jesus. It's a heart and mind thing. It's combining those things within us that help us to stay focused. Pastor Randy talked about uh, it, it is our heart and our mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's a heart and mind thing. It's a soul thing that we have to align up with the spirit man. And I don't want to get, I, I'm really tempted, but I won't do it. I won't get into that crazy stuff because I want us to stay focused and recognize the power of focus. Let's Look at this verse, Genesis 30, verses 37 to 39. This is probably one of the strangest stories in the scripture, unless you understand a little bit of focus. Jacob took fresh-cut branches from poplar 
almond and plane trees and made white stripes on them by peeling the bark and exposing the white inner wood of the branches. Then he placed the peeled branches in all the watering troughs so they would be directly in front of the flocks. Directly in front of the flocks when they came to drink. When the flocks were in heat and they came to drink, they made it directly in front of the branches and they bore young that were streaked or speckled or spotted. How in the world did Jacob land on this as a strategy? This is not a thing. Okay? I know this much about animal husbandry, but that might be more than some of you. Might be significantly less as well. But in the research that I've done, there's no such thing as planting poplar branches in front of animals to make them do a certain thing. So what, what's going on here? Well, what's going on here is something beyond the natural. Where did he come into this idea? The angel of the Lord gave him this idea. Who's the angel of the Lord? First guess is always Jesus when you're in church. Good job. You're exactly right. Jesus came in a dream. The same Jesus who we believe wrestled Jacob some years earlier, about 14 years earlier to this time. Jesus is a pretty good wrestler, it turns out. Jacob wrestled with him all night. And in the break of day, the angel of the Lord touched his hip, knocked it out. He forever walked with a limp. God himself came in the form of a dream. The angel of the Lord came in the dream and showed him what to do during the breeding season. We read the text from Genesis 31, 10 through 13. Why? Because Jacob's father-in-law, Laban, was a cheater. Why was he a cheater? Because Jacob was a cheater. He was a usurper. That's what his name meant. And he would go about cheating people. He cheated his brother. He deceived his father. We can look at Jacob and we say, that's one of the patriarchs? This is one of the great men of the faith? I love that the Bible just makes it honest and plain. I don't know about you, but I love that he, God doesn't really varnish the truth. It's the unvarnished truth that he shares. He was shrewd, this Laban, and he was unfair because he continually restructured Jacob's compensation by separating the flock. And so one day Laban says, look, you know, sorry, Jacob comes up to Laban and says, look, I've worked for my 14 years. My first wife, he charged me seven years labor. She wasn't such a hot looker, so I married her sister. It's a bizarre story. I don't know. Things were different. Um, so seven years later, 14 years in total, and Jacob comes to his father-in-law who had gotten wealthy, wealthy, wealthy. And he says, look, I, I'm, you know, I'm about, I'm about Dunsies here. I, I'd like to be released. And his, his father-in-law, Laban, says, no, why don't, you, why don't you work just a little bit longer? Six years. Come and work with me. And I'll give you, I'll give you all the speckled, spotted, and striped sheep. How's that sound? Jacob takes a deep breath and says, all right, I'll do that. So what does Laban do? He works it out with his sons who strip out all the speckled, spotted, and striped sheep and goats. And he sends them off on a three-day journey. So when Jacob wakes up the next morning, there's no sheep at all that he could grab a hold of and take as his own. That is mean. That is cruel. That is sneaky. That is Jacob. That is a usurper. And Jacob met his match in his father-in-law Laban. But the interesting thing is, is that God is in control. Just like the story of Lot and Abraham, Abraham gets up and says, look, you, you choose. Take the best. Whatever you want to do. You go one way, I'll go the other. Lot takes the best land. Abraham could have been frustrated by that, but God says, look, you gave him the best land. I'm going to give you the rest. I'm going to give you everything. Every place you set your foot to is going to be yours. See, it's a point of focus. It's a point of recognition of who is in control and what is actually going on. 
All these sheep and goats were stripped away. Laban thought he was going to get cheap labor this way, but God showed Jacob how to increase his flocks by partnering with a living God. Jacob peeled the branches, placed them directly in front of the watering hole when the sheep were in heat. So what's going on? Again, this is not animal husbandry. That's, this is not a thing there. This is quantum physics. This is God changing natural order. This is him coming in beyond that which is normal and natural. The supernatural happens right there in front of the watering troughs as the animals came to mate. The visual and mental focus, visual and mental focus on those striped, speckled, and spotted branches resulted in newborn, newborn lambs and kids reflecting the pattern made by those branches, thus increasing Jacob's flock. Jacob, over this next six years, became extremely wealthy. Is this genius on Jacob's part? No. God created the dynamic of quantum physics to accomplish it. Not only did the animals see the branches while they were mating, but Jacob also focused on the vision he saw. Understand this, not some hocus pocus, pie in the sky, blab it, grab it, claim it, frame it, prosperity preacher doctrine. This is partnering with God to see his purposes unleashed on the earth. Not only did the animals focus, I don't know about you, but when it comes time for the food trough, I'm fairly focused, okay? And when it comes time to spending time doing other things, I tend to be fairly focused. And there is a focus in the minds of these sheep and goats. Jacob came up with the idea, not on his own, but because he listened and believed. God told him in a dream. <laughs> I've had some amazing dreams, most of which I don't remember. I don't know about you, but I do believe that there are such things as spiritual dreams where God wants us to pay attention, and he wants us to do warfare. He wants us to go to battle with those things. I believe that God probably gives us million-dollar ideas, but we are too distracted by the shiny stuff in our life, by the cell phone in our pocket. We're too distracted by life to really pay attention. But when we do, we partner with the God of heaven, the God of the universe, and we do battle. And he uses it to make a difference on the earth. They were focused. The supernatural came to be the visual and mental focus on those striped, speckled, and spotted branches resulted in newborn lambs and kids reflecting the pattern made in those branches, thus increasing Jacob's flock. This is not a genius move on Jacob's part. God created this experience. He created this strategy. Jacob focused on the vision he saw in his dream, and he wound up way more prosperous than Laban. Jacob's flocks increased, his family increased, more children, more opportunities, more heritage, more inheritance. Within six years, he gained all of the wealth that he'd lost, plus, 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 plus. He was a wealthy man as he left Uncle Laban, his father-in-law's house. He gained all of this new wealth from the man who had changed his wages ten times. Despite Laban's cheating, God still put Jacob on the top. It's about to get real in this place. God, the creator, designed our minds and our bodies to, to increase the potential for good in our lives. The concentration of focus means the concentration of of energy or attention on something. As a verb, it means to direct one's attention on something, to aim at or zero in, kind of like you guys were doing the last couple of weeks when you were hunting. You were focusing in, putting the target right over where you wanted to shoot. It also means to bring into focus our ideas, our imaginations, or emotions. Given the definition of focus, I think you can see with me that this is absolutely essential to what's going on here with Jacob. Jacob, in spite of his cheating father-in-law, kept his focus not on the cheater, not on being cheated, not on being hoodwinked. 
He didn't focus on that. He instead put his focus on a promise that God made to him at Bethel, the, the house of God, where the, the ladder went up and down and he laid his head on a, on a stone and he dreamt these dreams. God says, there's going to come a time when you're going to want to get out of here and you're going to want to come back to Bethel. I'm going to be with you. And these are some of the strategies that I want you to use to increase your wealth because you're going to need it because you're going to be a father to the nations. I need us all to understand that for 20 years, Jacob suffered injustice at the hand of his father-in-law. But he kept on imagining. He kept on dreaming. He kept on harking back to what God had done in his past. The great things that God has done. As Randy shared as he came up here, he reminded us, has God been good in this week? It took us a while, but we got there and we said, yeah, even in this week, God has been good. But we can hearken much farther back than just week. We need a clear vision and we need some solid priorities because I want you to know that no matter the outcome of this election, the cheating or the injustice involved or what that means for our nation's future, God is still in control. We still have our kingdom destinies intact. We still got stuff to do, brother, sister. We're not off the hook, no matter what happens in this next couple of weeks. We still have stuff to do. And we can choose to focus on the injustice, or we can choose to focus on partnership. Let's go on to the next slide. We'll be digging into these more deeply, these priorities. I think we need to go one more. There we go. Coming soon to a home group near you. Jesus in real life 2.0. Because we're going to be talking about priorities. Boundaries and priorities become the windows and the doors of our spiritual house. Priorities give us clear goals and they help set up clear boundaries for ourselves and our families. The boundaries of priorities are vital. Knowing who you are and what the boundaries are in your life and how you prioritize how you spend your time here on earth is a great way to live with balance and boundaries. So I invite you to be a part of that. Boundaries, priorities. We all have a priority to keep God first, right? We all have a spouse or some of us have a spouse. We, if you have a spouse, you still need to work on your marriage. No matter what the outcome of the election is. You got to still love your wife. You got to still love your husband. You got to work on it. If you don't have a spouse, you have the opportunity to focus even more on your number one priority, your relationship with God. If you're a mom or dad, you still have a priority as well. You got to protect your children. You got to love them. You got to feed them. You got to train up your children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. It's not the government's job. Sorry. Not the government's job, not the school's job. It's not even the church's job. We all partner together. It's okay. I'm not saying you can't send your kids to school. I'm not saying you can't send your kids to kids' school back or kids' church in the back there. You can do those things. But it's your responsibility in the end. God is going to hold you accountable. Each of us can partner with you, but as COVID-19 showed us, when push comes to shove, we're on our own. Okay? We have the body of Christ, and I know that we work together to encourage and to bless. But the government didn't come and give me anything, not for a long time. And it, even when it did come up with 1200 bucks, it took it from stuff that I've spent and given them in the past. Ain't no such thing as a free lunch. COVID-19 showed us. We are on our own and that's probably a great place to be because we focus. <laughs> we focus. We focus when there ain't nothing else out there except us and God. Do you really want your kids to be force-fed some of the lies and perversions taught it as normal in our public schools? You got a job to do, parents. That's your third priority. Church still needs to be a priority. Randy and I know it's not the most important thing. We wish it were, but it's not. We, if you're sick, we want you to stay home. If you're not sick, we kind of like you to be here. Not because we miss you or we miss your money, 
or any of those things, we miss the opportunities to see God's people come into a place of celebration. So it's not the most important thing, but it is important. So make it a priority. It's right up there. I know it's convenient to do church in your PJs. Thank God for COVID. It gave us a chance to worship Jesus in our jammies. I got some, I got some nice ones. Watch sermons and services on demand. That was, that was nice. But there's a power in coming together. It's good for us. And it's good for others. That's your fourth priority as church. Number five, your job still needs you. Your job still needs you. Not the other way around. That's a trap. They need you. The relationships and the interactions that you have on the job can be life-changing. It's the way God chooses to bless us. Bless us. It can be life-changing for your co-workers. Redeem the time that you're at work. So if you focus on the right things, nothing can stop what God has placed in your heart to do. Just keep moving in that direction. Don't let COVID restrictions, the result of an election, or any of the affairs of this world distract you from your mission. God's got all that stuff under control. He's God. I'm not. He's God. You're not. He's God. Donald Trump is not. He's God. The government is not. He is sovereign. He's got that stuff under control. He is deciding, though, to partner with us to bring change to the entire world. He wants to start with you. He wants to start with me. And the challenge for us is not to get distracted. Keep your vision directly in front of you. Just like Jacob kept the vision of the branches. Just like those sheep and goats kept the vision of the branches right in front of them. Partner with God. Keep it directly in front of you until your potential collapses into solid reality. That's as much as quantum physics as I'm going to share with you at this moment. But that's what's going on right now throughout the universe. Are you with me? Final slide. No, dear brothers and sisters, you can stand with me. I have not achieved it, but I focused on this one thing. Forgetting the results of the election. Forgetting the frustrations of COVID-19. Forgetting it all. The past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Amen? How about you? Are you forgetting that stuff? You're going to let it go? Get it in the past? I'll bet you most of us are going to be very, very happy to see 2020 come to an end. But it's not going to get any better until we stay focused. 2021 isn't going to get better unless we get focused on what God is doing and recognizing he's partnering with us. Do you guys want to come up and share a song? We're going to close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being in this place. God, we recognize that you are sovereign and we are not. You are God and we are not. God, you have called us, though, to partner with you. You've given us the ability to think creatively, to take that, those ideas that you give to us and to focus on those and to believe that you are going to change the reality, the physical reality around us to conform with your spiritual reality. We recognize, God, that you're collapsing things and you are creating things. Father, we do pray for the results of this election. Lord, we recognize that stuff has happened. Bad, bad stuff. Weird stuff. Lord, we recognize also that you are sovereign over those things. We pray that you would expose every work of darkness, every fraudulent thing. Lord, we recognize that you are a God of truth. The truth sets us free. So, Father, we pray that truth would be expounded and that falseness would be exposed. Lord, that your kingdom would be 
exalted, that your kingdom would come, that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, we, we entrust this whole mess to you, knowing that you make mess, you, you bring good out of messes all the time. It's not too big for you. God, we just release it into your hand. We choose to focus not on the lies. We choose to focus not on the cheating, not on the Laban who wants to change our, our wages ten times. Lord, we choose to focus on the dream that you gave us, the strategy that you gave us. Lord, we will be enriched as we go through this in partnership with you. All God's people said, Amen. God bless you. Worship team. Do you feel the world's broken? Do you feel the world's broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting?
to be dismissed, but we're going to do one more song. So if you want to stay, you're very, very welcome.
generations in your family, your children, and their children, their children.